Well, we're in this series called Unshakable. We're talking about building an unshakable faith. How do you have faith in a pandemic? How do you have faith when everything around you is falling apart? How do you have faith when everybody else seems not to have faith? When you have questions about life, how do you have faith? Because we all go through life. We all go through difficult times in life. Backstage uh, this morning in the production meeting, uh, the, the uh, tech team and the band and the worship team was talking about this, that we all experience life. Life sometimes throws you curveballs. How do you develop a faith that is going to stand the test during times like that? Well, we've been talking about how you do that. We talked about one week, building your faith on the Word of God, how you can trust the Bible, how you need to read the Bible. We talked about building your faith, unshakable faith on God, who He is, His character. We gave you some ideas about how to talk with friends of yours that may have questions about, does God exist? We talked about some of the characteristics of God and God's purpose. And so um, then we talked about Jesus, always wonderful to talk about Jesus. And I love talking about Jesus at Avalon Church. We say at Avalon Church, we take Jesus very seriously, everything else not so much. So if you come and you're offended, um, you know, some people, I've I've had people tell me, well, I I didn't come to church to be offended. And I said, well, where do you normally go? Church is as good a place as any, right? All right. So, but we really learn how to build our faith when we put our trust in Jesus when we put our trust in God, when we put our trust in the Word of God, it will make us stronger. It'll help us grow. It'll give us the building blocks that we need for a Christian life. Well, today, I want to talk about that fourth building block, the thing that is a tangible thing. Now, you can't see God. You can see His handiwork. You can see how He does things. You can read about Him, learn about Him in the Bible. You can experience God. But it's not tangible that you can touch. Jesus is the same. You'll be able to touch Jesus one day, but right now you cannot touch him. Uh, We read about him. We know about him. We have a relationship with him. We trust him with our soul, with our salvation. But the fact is, you can't touch him right now, okay? And today, I want to talk about something that is physical, that is tangible, that is important, that God wants you to be a part of, that God has called you, if you're a believer, to be a part of. And today I want to talk to you about how church strengthens your faith or why church is important. Now, there are many people in our culture that don't think church is important. I've read that 40% of Americans say they go to church. I highly doubt that. I just know driving out of my neighborhood, it doesn't seem like 40% of them are gone, all right? I don't think 40% of my neighborhood is, is going to church. Maybe your, church, your neighborhood is that way. Mine does not happen to be that way. Uh, the relationships that I have, even believers, I'm not sure that there are 40% of believers that go to church in our culture. And the reason for that is, I believe personally, they've been deceived by the enemy, they've been deceived by the devil into believing that a church is not that important in their life. That a Christian without a church is okay. I've heard people say things like this. I can worship God just as good on the golf course as you can in church. And whereas that may be true, that may be true for you, not for me, because I get frustrated when I'm on a golf course and there are words that come out that probably should not come out in church, all right? So uh, maybe not. You say, well, I can go out into nature and worship God. That's true. You should be able to worship God wherever you are. And church is about worship. But let me tell you something. There is something about a local gathering of believers that nothing can take the place of. No amount of Christian radio can take the place of. No matter of watching on YouTube uh, or watching podcasts can take the place of. And God has called you and called me to be a part of a local church. So today we're gonna talk about how we can be a part of that and what God wants us to see the church as. When I was about four or five years old, I got tired of the rules at my house. My mom and dad were always telling me when to eat, what to eat, 
when to go to bed, when to get up, and when to take a bath. I don't know if you grew up in a household like that, but my parents told me what to do. And I got tired of that, and I went to my mom one day. I was, like I said, I was only four or five years old. And I told my mom, I'm going to run away. Anybody ever do that when you're a kid? All right. I did that, and my mom did not react the way I thought she would. I thought she would be in tears. I thought she'd be begging me to stay. But all she did was look at me. She said, okay, be careful now, and don't forget supper. And I'm like, well, that was not what I expected. And so I gathered a stick. You know, I always saw on cartoons these, uh, these cartoons that would have a stick with a handkerchief with their belongings in it hanging over their shoulder. So I grabbed me a stick, and I don't know where I found the handkerchief, but I tied it to that. And I ran away, four or five years old. And I made it all the way to the end of the driveway. And I sat down, and I started thinking about it. I concluded that home was where I was fed. That's a pretty good reason to stay home, isn't it? You get food there. I mean, I, I not only got breakfast and lunch and supper, I got snacks, all right? I mean, home was where I was fed. Home was where I was cared for. Home was where I was loved. Home was where I was supported. So I grabbed my stick, and I marched back up the driveway, and I told my mom, I'm back. I didn't run away for very long at all. But you know, I, I've thought about this. There are a lot of Christians who leave the place that they're fed. They leave the place that they're loved. They leave the place that they're cared for and supported, the church. And then they wonder why they have difficulty in life. Oh, you're going to have difficult times in life. Don't get me wrong. But the beauty about being in a relationship with Jesus Christ and in a relationship with the local church is you've got somebody there that loves you. You've got somebody there that supports you. When you're having a difficult time, there's somebody that can put their arm around your shoulder. There's somebody that can tell you that they love you. There's somebody that can tell you that they understand. There's somebody that lets you know that you're a part of the family, that you're a part of the team. And I really do believe that many people believe that belonging to a church is optional, but it's not. Not if you want to be healthy, not if you want to be supported and loved. You see, that kind of thinking limits your spiritual growth. It limits your relationship with Christ. It hinders God's blessings in your life. Yes, and I'll say that again. God blesses people who are faithful to his church. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody that goes to church every week is perfect. In fact, we have a saying here at Avalon Church. We are the perfect place for imperfect people. If you think that the church has got to be filled with perfect people, then you've got the biblical uh, definition of what a church is all wrong. Church is not the place for people that are perfect. Church is the place for people that know that they're imperfect. I've said it this way often. Church is not a country club for the initiated, for the insiders. Church is a hospital for the sick. It is a place where we get our eyes on our perfect Savior. We're not perfect, but he is. And if you think that coming to church, you've got to put on your Sunday face. Now, I suggest that you take a shower before you come, okay? I'm not suggesting that you can. When we say come as you are, we mean that, but maybe put on some clothes. Don't come in your pajamas, all right? Um, the fact is, this is a place where you can come. Are there perfect people here? No. I've been a part of churches, I've been to churches that they want to act like that everybody there is perfect. And if you come in and you're imperfect, they want to get, they want to get in a staring contest with you. You ever been a part of that? You ever seen, seen that? You ever visited there? The fact of the matter is, folks, we have a opportunity to be able to be blessed by God when we are a part of his church. And so I want to talk to you about how important this is. You see, a, a Christian without a church is like an organ without a body. Did you know that the Bible describes the church, us, as a body? And in fact, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he said that, you know, some are eyes and some are ears and some are other parts of the body. What if all of a sudden 
You decided, hey, I'm not going to be a part of this body, and I'm just a big old ear, and I'm just going to walk around as a big old ear, and I'm not going to be a part of the body. Well, where would be the smell? Where would be the taste? Where would be the eating? Where would be the walking? You see, the fact is, a Christian without a church is like an organ without a body. A Christian without a church is like a child without a family. Listen to what Romans 12, 5 says. In Christ, now the key is being in Christ. In Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. If I'm an ear, I'm a part, I'm a part of the body, and I don't show up, and I don't participate, guess what? The body is down one ear. The body suffers, in other words. And so it is a big deal if you come or not. It is a big deal if you're faithful or not. It is a big deal if you participate or not. It's it's huge. It's very, very important. And so we're fond of saying here at Avalon Church, participation is membership. And you were designed to belong. You need to understand that. You were not made to be alone. We're not talking about romantic relationship. The Bible says God does give some people the gift of singleness. Thank God I did not get that gift. My wife and I have been married for almost 35 years. It'll be 35 years in May. And we're very, very glad to be uh, a part of each other's lives. At least I'm very glad to be a part of our marriage, okay? I say to Kim every once in a while, can you believe? It just seems like that. Can you believe it's been 35 years? She said, I can, (laughs) you know. (laughs) I'm not sure what that means. It sometimes hurts my feelings. But nevertheless, we say participation is membership. You were designed to belong. Membership means being involved. You see, a lot of people think that membership is like being a member of Facebook. Let me just take a real simple poll. How many of you are on Facebook? You have a Facebook account of some kind. Raise your hand. All right, most of everybody in here. Raise your hand if you do not have a Facebook account. Okay, a couple of weirdos. All right, so uh, no, I'm just kidding. I have a Facebook account and a Facebook page and I promise you if it were not for the fact that I'm the pastor of this church and I gotta stay connected through that, I would not have Facebook because I just think it's just such, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It can be a blessing for sure, uh, but it can also be a colossal waste of time. But think about this. When I joined Facebook, they did not tell me how often I had to get on Facebook. And I got to warn you, if you want to get a hold of me, the way to get a hold of me is not through Facebook because I don't get on there very often. Now, I am like many Christians are with church. I'm a member of Facebook. I just don't go very often. And there are a lot of people that are just like that. You see, being a member means that you participate. That's what being a member really is about, that you're a part of it, that you participate. It means that you are an important part of God's family. Have you ever thought about that? A lot of people see church as being restrictive. Church is a blessing. It's a place where you get fed. It's a place where you can worship God. It's a place where you get uplifted. But it's also a place where you're very, very important. Now, there are not many places in life that most of us are very important. I mean, I wish that was different. But the truth of the matter is, in my neighborhood, I'm not a very important person in my neighborhood. Um, I'm not a member of any committee. I don't, uh, I'm not on the uh, neighborhood association. I just kind of come and go and, you know, live my life, all right? If I were to move, uh, there'd be a couple people that would notice, but most people wouldn't. Uh, The fact is that we are members of many things in life that we're not that big of a deal. Now, I know that we all think we're kind of a big deal, you know, kind of like Ron Burgundy. I don't know if you know this, but I'm kind of a big deal around here. Um, But the truth of the matter is, at church, you're a very big deal. You're important. Why? Because God says you are. Not because I say you are, but because God says you are. And so I want to challenge you today as we think about what church means. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, the second part from the Living Bible says, you belong in God's household with every other Christian. You belong. Now, let me just quickly give you what a church actually is, okay? 
Because a lot of people get confused about what church is. A church must teach and preach the Word of God. That's discipleship. So if a place has the clear teaching and preaching of the Word of God, that's a part of being a church. A church must baptize new believers. That's evangelism. If a church doesn't ever baptize people, my question is, is it really a church? They might have a church building. They might have a church charter. But are they a church? I don't think so. According to the Bible, churches baptize new believers. Um, A church must teach and practice biblical communion. We're going to have communion together on Good Friday. I hope you'll be a part of it. It's going to be fantastic. But churches have communion in small group and in church. That's fellowship. A, A church must have a regenerate membership. You say, what does that mean? That means that if you're going to be a part of Avalon Church, that you got to be a believer. you got to be a follower of Jesus Christ. you got to be born again. you got to be saved, whatever you, you want to say, whatever terminology you want to use. Next Sunday, we have our next step class. Do you know that it is often, in fact, most times, when we have our next step class, and it's been a little bit di- different during the pandemic, of course, uh, but during the next step class, very few Sundays uh, that we have that, do we not have somebody that signs up either to be saved or to be baptized? Wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. So a regenerate membership means that, um, that you're, you're a believer. You see, back in the 13, 1400s, earlier, a little bit later, uh, you've probably read about the Great Reformation from the, uh, the, uh, the 1300, 1400s, rather, 14, 1500s, and the Protestant church grew out of that. Do you know one of the reasons why they did that? Was because the church had become more political than it had spiritual. And there were many people that were actually leaders in the church. We're talking about priests and all kinds of levels of leadership that were not even Christian. So a church is made up of believers. It's a regenerate membership. A church must encourage spirit-empowered participation. That's ministry. In other words, we want you to participate. That's serving God, using your gift. A church must practice dependence on Christ. That's worship. A church must possess a generous spirit and receive offerings from God's people. That's giving. Uh, A church must have a worldwide gospel focus. That's missions. So if if a congregation of people meets those qualifications, then that's a church. That's what a church is. Um, I'm not sure that some churches that claim to be churches are actually functioning as churches are supposed to. My parent, my dad was a pastor for many years. They're retired now. And my dad and mom were members of this church for about five years. In five years, they never saw a single person get baptized. Not one. And my dad and mom, they, you know, they would ask how we were doing, and I'd tell them about the number of people that would get baptized and saved and so forth. And I finally asked my dad one day, I said, Dad, Did you ever go a year without baptizing or seeing people saved? He said, no, man, we had a lot of people saved and baptized. I said, do you think the the membership that you have, do you think that's actually a church? And he's like, wow, I haven't thought about that. The truth of the matter is, folks, God has called us to be a part of something that is presenting the gospel and furthering the gospel. That's why those are qualifications of a church. Now, what are the metaphors of a church in Scripture. There are several, and I want you to get these because they're very important. Uh, The Bible calls the church or church members the people of God, the people of God. You know what that represents? It represents belonging. If you are a part of a family or a part of the people of God, it simply means that you belong, that, that there is a place that you belong, a place where people can know your name, a place where people can know you and pray for you and love you. Very, very important. The people of God. Another metaphor is the body of Christ. That represents union with Christ and his purpose. You ever thought about this? That union with Christ is something that should be a part of your thinking all the time. The Bible talks about that we are in Christ. It is 
in Christ that we have blessings. It is in Christ that we have an inheritance that was given to Jesus that is ours as well. It is in Christ that we are able to go to heaven when we die. It is in Christ when we stand before God in that court and the enemy is pointing his finger at us and saying, I know that person and let me tell you what they did. It is in Christ that God can look at us and say, I don't see any sin. Their sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. All I see is the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. In Christ. In Christ. We're the body of Christ. That's a beautiful metaphor. Um, and, and that means that we're a part of his purpose on earth. We're his representative. The Bible says that we are the temple of God. That represents worship. I don't know if you came to uh, the night of worship last week, but it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And if you've never been, I hope that you'll come to the next one. I, uh, I observed, uh, you know, I, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to do more observing than I am participating because uh, those of you know that I've been struggling with uh, peripheral neuropathy and radiculopathy and a bunch of other apathies that I don't know what they mean. I just know that it's cost me a lot of money for them to tell me those words that I can't spell. So, um, but you know, I'm getting better, thank God, getting better every week, and he thinks I'm going to have a full recovery. But, you know, I can't stand very long at this point. And I found myself standing during the worship. And I was like, what in the world am I doing? I need to sit back down. My back's hurting. But you know what I observed uh, last Sunday night? Is that the Spirit of God fell. And then in some people's lives, I want you to get this, for the very first time, for the very first time, they, over, they experienced the overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. And I believe that set them forward in their spiritual growth. I hope you'll come to the next one. You know why? It's not for us. It's not so we can count see how many people showed up. It's not so we can do a concert. You know what it's for? It's for you. It's for you. And when you begin to understand that we are the temple of God and that we are to worship a holy God, man, does it change your life. The Bible calls us a royal priesthood. You know what that represents? It represents evangelism. Why is that? Because in the Bible, priests were representatives of God, and they were go be the go-between or the advocate for God to people, and from people to God. You know what the Bible says about you and me? That we are a royal priesthood. In other words, we are God's representative here on this earth. We represent God to lost people that need Jesus, and that's what our job is. Um, the Bible says that we are a flock. That represents Christ's ownership and our need for him, a flock. Um, and then the, my favorite is a family or a bride, and that represents relationship. And the older I get, I'm 56 years old, and the older I get, the more I understand how important relationships are, the, the more important they become to me, the more I realize that I not only need them, but I desire them. And when you are a part of the family of God and you're a part of the bride of Christ, you are in relationship, which God has said that we need. So today, speaking of that relationship, um, I want to read out of Ephesians 5, verses 25 to 32. God uses the relationship between husband and wife to give us a peek into what the church is like. Actually, uh, he uses the, the church to show us what marriage should be like. Actually, is what he was doing here. But let me read this uh, and just make some comments that will hopefully help you. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. You know what the word holy means? It means to be set apart. It means to be dedicated. And so what God is saying here is that in the same way that husbands are to love their wives unconditionally, God and Jesus loves us unconditionally. You know what the church should be characterized by? Unconditional love. Unconditional love. You see, a lot of churches, a lot of Christians, they want to make their love conditional. As long as you like the same kind of music we do, as long as you like to dress like we do, as long as you like to look like we do, uh, as long as you like to believe politically like we do, then you can be a part of our club. But that's not what the Bible says the church should be, Un 
conditional love. Also, that he can present his, uh, the, the church to himself as holy. In other words, that's a separated part. It's separated unto, um, just like a, a husband and wife are separated unto each other, that they are holy. The church is the same way with Christ. And so God wants us to have this, uh, this idea that there is unconditional love and that we are given to one another, to serve one another, to love one another. Very important. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, quoting from the book of Genesis, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. There is this divine mystery of the relationship between God and us. Oh, it's not difficult to grasp. It's not difficult to understand, but it's very mysterious as to why. I know, I understand God's love for me. I get it. He has unconditional love for me. He pours out his love through Jesus Christ, and I get how great his love is, and I'm overwhelmed by it. But you know, the one thing that I've never been able to figure out is why. Oh, I know God is holy. I know this is the character of God, and he does this for himself, not for us. But I still don't get how he loves me so much. How many times I've failed in life, how many times I've sinned in life, how many times I've come up short in life, and yet he loves me. It's a mystery. And if you want to be a part of this beautiful mystery, look at marriage to be able to understand what it's like. You know what one of the beautiful things about marriage is? The mystery of it. The mysterious nature of it. I I often tell young couples that are having difficulty with communication. First of all, just keep at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. You'll get better at it if you stay at it. When Kim and I were first married, I did not know how to read what she said, because I'm a man, all right? And when I would ask her what was wrong, and she would say nothing, I thought that meant nothing, all right? That's honestly thought. That's what that word means. And I, and I didn't realize that there were different meanings to the word nothing, that sometimes it meant nothing, shut up, leave me alone, all right? Sometimes it meant nothing, unless you really love me, and then you'll know and then sometimes it meant nothing, but if you really love me, you're going to ask again. And so I, I was confused. For the first several years of our marriage, I was totally confused. I did not know what to say. I got to where I was like, I'm just going to like drill down and just try to find out what it is because I think that nothing doesn't really mean nothing. And I learned that sometimes nothing does mean nothing, and it's my problem that I don't understand and know which one it means, all right? So I had to learn this beautiful mystery. Now, we make jokes about the difference the way men and women communicate, the way men and women uh, live and look at life and so forth. But you know what one of the things that I'm most thankful for about Kim is that she is completely different than me. Thank God. I mean, she's a woman, I'm a man. Thank God, you know? I mean, the fact is, her personality is completely different than mine. Thank God. She communicates differently than I do. Thank God. She has more compassion than I do. Thank God. She loves people more than I do. Thank God. She loves our kids more than I do. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. As far as you know. All right. So, um, but the point is this. You know what I've learned to appreciate about mine and Kim's relationship? That it's a beautiful mystery. I don't look at things the same way she does. But you know what she does? She brings something to the table that I do not. And by the same token... I don't look at life the way she does. And I bring something to the table that she does not. And together we make one flesh. And I've taught this before. Biblical math is one plus one plus one equals one. God plus a man plus a woman equals one flesh. That's what God, the way God wants you to live. And so there's this beautiful mystery to it. And... Um, let me just give you, and I, I realize this is like the world's longest introduction for a short message, all right? So uh, this message, uh, the points of it are going to be very brief, all right? 
so you can relax. All right, some of you are like, <laughs> talking about church, you know. Uh, let me give you these thoughts. There's three of them, how God wants you to view the church. Number one, he wants you to see the church as a place of commitment. You really can't be a part of a church without committing. We say participation is membership. It's like being a member of Facebook and never getting on if you don't really see church as a place of commitment. It is a place where we commit to God and to one another. And so I want you to look at your commitment level and see where you are in that relationship with God. Number two, see the church as a place of communion. Now, God wants us to commit. He also wants us to have communion with one another and with him. We're not just talking about taking communion, bread and wine. We're talking about having communion with each other, having communion and fellowship with one another. It is a place of friendships and love and support. That's what God wants you to see. It is a place of communion. And then finally, we need to see the church as a place of commission. What do I mean by that? Well, the Great Commission is that God wants us to take the good news to every person everywhere, all across the world. Our job is to spread the gospel. We are to be a part of a church and to see the church as a place of commission. And the question then that I have is this, are you committed? Are you participating? Do you have communion at this place? And are you participating in the commission? God wants us to. That's what the church is for. I've said this before, and I want you to get it because I really do believe it. Success begins on Sunday. Success begins on Sunday. And if you want to have success in life, and I really believe this from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, success spiritually, yes. God's blessings, yes. But I believe success in other areas of life as well. Have you ever noticed, I have people come up to me every week and tell me this almost. Man, I didn't feel like coming today, but boy, I tell you what, when I came at last week, and uh, man, I, I saw that uh, what the message was, you, it felt like you were talking just to me, and man, it helped me get through the week. What am I saying? I'm saying that God says that success begins on Sunday. It begins with our worship. Our vision is bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We're about commission, bringing people wherever they are, Christians and non-believers alike. Wherever they are, that means we're a place with open arms. We're not going to be putting signs at the door. You've got to dress a certain way, look a certain way, or even believe a certain way. You know, the beauty of this place over the years is we've seen people that were atheists, they started coming here and they felt the love of God. They felt accepted and they got saved. I could tell you story after story after story of that. People that were Buddhists, people that were atheists, people that were moral people that had been in church all their life and realized that they were not true believers. People that were church dropouts, they had been out for a long time. And I could go down the list, drug addicts, alcoholics, people that actually had murdered people and started coming to this church. I could go down the list. Why? Because our belief is that we are to bring people wherever they are. If you're not a believer, we don't expect you to act like a believer. We want you to start coming and learning about Jesus so that you can become a believer. Bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus. That's the most important part of it. We could be open-armed and open-minded all we want, but if we're not pointing people to Jesus, we're not doing what the church is supposed to do. Bringing them to have a, a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we say Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. So what do we want you to do? What is your next step? Well, if you're not saved, get saved. See, so what does that mean? It means invite Christ into your life as the Lord of your life. And you ask him for forgiveness and to be made right with God. That's what it means. And watching online, click that button if you pray to receive Christ today. Here in the audience, fill out that next step card and put on there that you pray to receive Christ today if you want to receive Jesus today. You say, what do I pray? Something like this, and it's not a magical prayer. It is, however, the heart that matters. 
Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my life and to change me, to save me right now. If you'll say that prayer, I guarantee it's the one prayer that I know for sure that God will answer. And you ask him, and he'll save you. Um, If you've already been saved, but you haven't been baptized, get baptized. We're going to baptize on Easter Sunday. What a beautiful thing. If you got baptized on Easter, the greatest Sunday of the year, be a beautiful thing if you got baptized on Easter Sunday. And then if you've already done that, be committed. Go to the Next Step class next Sunday. If, you're not, if you haven't gone through the Next Step class yet, do it next Sunday. It's going to be live. We're going to teach it. It's just right down that hallway. You walk past the bathrooms, and then the hall, turn right. And there's a room there that, uh, that we'll have it in. If you don't know where that is, you can find a host or somebody with a lanyard, and they'll show you where it is. But we need to make sure that we're following Christ and being a part of the church the way he wants us to be. Well, maybe today this spoke to you, but it's a building block. I'm assuming that most of you in this room have received Christ. And so I'm going to ask this question. Would you say that you need prayer, either A, in participation, or B, it's time for you to take a next step, whatever that is. That Our next steps are... Uh, Very important. If you're new to Avalon Church, fill us out. Let us know how to connect you. If you have not been through the Next Step class, sign up to go next Sunday or just show up. Uh, If you've not been baptized, sign up on this. Drop it in the box on the way out so we'll know to be prepared for you. But on Easter Sunday, we're going to make sure that you can get baptized. Okay? Whatever your next step is, you want to be involved in a ministry, you want to be involved in a small group, see someone at Next Step Central. But that's our prayer for you today is that you will take your next step. And God bless you as you participate because participation is membership. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the church. I pray now, Lord, that you would help all of us to take this seriously. Help us all to examine our heart, our commitment. Help us all to examine where we are Are we at a place in our spiritual walk where we need to take a next step? Do we need to continue to grow? And God, I pray that you reveal that to us today. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to know that I love you. Thank you for being here today. And uh, I hope you'll be praying now about Easter. It's coming up quickly. It's going to be a big day for us. God bless you. I love you. And I'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.